Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. Title for today is Our Daily Choice, Living by Faith or Flesh. Are we going to live by faith or flesh? 1 Kings 18, 41 to 42. And to start off, I want to talk about zombie ants. I was reading a a great article in National Geographic this week. They came out with this new discovery, how a parasitic fungus turns ants into zombies. Uh, Really, pretty wild here. They walk among us. I'm just going to read you some excerpts here. They walk among us, insects, insects hijacked by parasitic fungi that control their every move. The, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Uh, this fungus has just one goal, self-propagation and dispersal. It's found in the tropical forest, so be careful if you're in the tropical forest. It infects a foraging ant through spores that attach and penetrate the echoskeleton and slowly take over its behavior. Some of you probably know where I'm going to go with this, don't you? Anyway, as the infection advances, the enthralled ant, enthralled ant is compelled to leave its nest for a more humid microclimate that's favorable to the fungus growth. The ant is compelled to descend to a vantage point about 10 inches off the ground, sink its jaws into a leaf vein on the north side of a plant, and wait for death. Meanwhile, so if I see any of you acting this way, we'll know. So anyway, meanwhile, the fungus feeds on its victim's innards, and it's ready for the final stage. Several days after the ant has died, the fungus sends a fruiting body out through the base of the ant's head, turning its shriveled corpse into a launch pad from which it can jettison its spores and infect new ants. Uh, there's also one that affects the fly. Once again, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it lit- the Greek word literally means insect destroyer of the fly. It, uh, it infects the flies, they climb to a certain height, glue themselves to a mouth of a plant, and assume an abdomen up death pose, which is op- optimal for spore dispersal. There's another one that pumps cicadas full of, uh, full of this uh, 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 hallucinogenic drug, and it causes part of their abdomen to fall off. The bare bottom cicada then wiggles its way towards death, again spreading the this, this spores everywhere. This is their last sentence of this. It's exciting terrain at the fringes of our understanding to look at the extent of how parasites control their host. If animals are so easily manipulated, what does that mean for us? A lot, actually, right? We can connect lots of dots to, to, to uh, the human host, can't we? we but it, you, there is definitely a hallucinogenic and all that kind of stuff controlling a lot of our population. We won't go there. But I want to look at the spiritual zombies. So many people are spiritual zombies. Are you one? Do you want to be free? Do you want to be set free? Today, that's what we're going to focus on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the worship today. We thank you for bringing us through the rain, which we need. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for the fellowship. We love being together here. We thank you for that too. And Lord, now we just pray that your word would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit would work. We pray for your mercy and grace for your Holy Spirit to do that through the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's read a couple verses here. We're, on, uh, we're coming up to 1 Kings 18. Now remember, Elijah's on Mount Carmel, right? On Mount Carmel. And he just had called fire down from heaven, which Baal, the prophets of Baal couldn't do, so he proved that Jehovah is the one true God. The, then he goes and kills the prophets of Baal. Remember last week? He, he killed them all. Uh, and, uh, listen to the CDs or go on the podcast, YouTube, if you missed that. But now, because of that, God's judgments, along with the people's response, Jehovah is God, they finally figure that out, uh, has made God's blessings possible. And that's the rain that's going to fall. But we're going to have to wait until next time for that, because we see something else that happens just before that. Let's read verses 41 to 42. And he Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the crowd, ground, and put his face between his knees. So I want to contrast Ahab's response with Elijah's response here, because there's amazing dots we're going to connect. This is showing us the difference between living by the flesh 
are living by faith. And this is really important because how we view life, whether it's through flesh or faith, is huge because it makes all the difference in the world, this world and the next one. First of all, let's start off with Ahab and the flesh. And Elijah said, verse 41, Elijah said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there's the sound of heavy rain. Ahab and the flesh. Picture this. Ahab, uh, Elijah has just got done butchering 450 prophets of Baal. He's coming up, you know, he's got the hairy garment, Elijah, covered with blood, you know. Probably still carrying the, the sword he hacked them to death with. You know, and picture, you, you think of a butcher, right, you know. But, but most of you have never been in a butcher shop where they really do the cows. But, but just, just covered beard, everything, just covered with blood. You know, think Walking Dead. Some of you watch Walking Dead. Think Walking Dead, you know, Rick fighting the zombies, you know. Picture this. He comes up and, and he comes up to Ahab and what is Ahab probably thinking? He's probably terrified. What is this bloody madman going to do next? He's going to kill me, right? He's probably terrified. And, but Elijah shocks him. He says, go eat. Go eat. Elijah knows Ahab very well. God didn't tell Elijah to kill Ahab. God's saving that for himself But later on. But Elijah knows Ahab very well. He knows that he is a man of the flesh. All he could think about was indulging his flesh. He's been observing this guy and confronting this guy and prophesying against this guy. He's just, he, and so what does he say? He says, go eat, you pig. But you better hurry because a big storm's coming. That's really what he said to him. All right? And so what does Ahab do? He goes and stuffs his face. Finally, he listens to Elijah. He's never listened to him before. He's never obeyed him before. Never took anything. But this time he listens, right? Because this is something he wants to do. So one time he obeys. And think about this. After what he has just seen, fire comes down from heaven and melts does everything, the rocks and the sacrifice, and just you know, obliterates it. What he had just seen, this amazing miracle. And then right after he sees a massacre. He sees these, these guys are killed, and he knows these guys. These 450 prophets of Baal ate with him every night. You know, they fed at Jezebel's table. They fed at the same pig's trough as he did, you know. They, they were trough mates. You know, a bunch of little piglets, they're eating away, right? And, and that's what they were. That's what they were just like, what we're going to see. Spiritually, that's what they were. He, they're just all massacred. And he can still go and eat. I mean, who could, who here could, could see fire come down from heaven and then your good friends massacred say, let's go get lunch. Let's go to the diner. It'd be crazy, but this is what this guy was like. He can still eat. And not only that, he knows Everybody on that hill is starving. The big mob was there starving to death. They're literally walking skeletons, you know? It's crazy. They're starving. There's been drought for three years. And, and he doesn't care. He's just going to go eat. Going to go eat feast. Here, where's the buffet line? Right? He, we already saw that. Remember he was feeding the donkeys instead of the people? He was worried about feeding the donkeys and not worried about the people eating. We already went. We know what this guy is like. What should he have done? What should he have done? I'm not going to eat. I'm going to get on my face. I'm going to fast. I'm, I'm going to fast until God sends the rain. What, that's what he should have done. Fell on his face and started fasting and repented. Repented. And thank God for his mercy and grace. Because he knows he should have been burned up. He knows that Elijah should be hacking him to death right now, right? He knows that should be, but he should be thanking God for his mercy and grace. You would think he'd be deeply convicted of his sin. That God has showed that he's the one true God. And, 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 and the worshiping of idols and all the horrible things, murdering the prophets of Jehovah. You think he would be convicted and, and with, with the deep realization that Jehovah is the one true God. And boy, I made a lot of mistakes there. But instead, he is partying. He's partying. Isn't that crazy? This is a man of the flesh. He's partying. It reminds me of uh, in the book of Daniel, Belteshazzar, right? Babylon's getting ready to fall. And what is Belteshazzar doing? He has a big party, right? Partying right up to the moment that the Babylon was taken. It reminds me of um, Nero fiddling while Rome burns, right? You know, not even, not, not, didn't care. The burning all around him. He doesn't care. It reminds me of, reminds me of uh, World War II, the Nazis. Remember in the Nazis when, when just as Berlin was getting ready to fall, they were all down in their bunkers at Hitler's bunker? And you know what they were doing down there? They were partying. 
They were partying. They had this music playing. They were dancing. They were getting drunk. They were, it was a crazy time. That's what they were doing as Berlin is getting ready to fall. As the Russians were squeezing around there, coming in. And, and that, and think of the USA today. Think of what we're facing, the, the tremendous sin that we talk about often, the tremendous sin that we have, are guilty of. Top of the list is killing the babies. Top of the list. And yet, so many people just oblivious, partying their way, partying their way through, their way to judgment. It's the same picture of the flesh. And Ahab was completely spiritually calloused. His mind and heart were hardened from ignoring God's word, from ignoring God and his word consistently. On the, growing up on a farm, we all had lots of calluses, but nobody had more calluses than my dad had. My dad's hands were like, you know, leather gloves. You know, it was crazy how callous his hands were. Everybody used to, like, I used to say, go shake my dad's hand. Go ahead, go ahead. You know, so rough. You know, it was like really, really hard. And because, it, because all that work and rubbing up against the stuff, it would get so hard that nothing could break through. He didn't have to wear gloves. Nothing could break through. And that's what happens to us spiritually, to our hearts. Spiritually, every time we ignore God's word, every time we ignore a conviction from God, our heart gets a little harder. And pretty soon it's so hard that nothing can penetrate through, just like the calloused hands, just like that. That's what Philippians 3, 18 and 19 is talking about. In Philippians 3, this, this very person is being described, which was all of us at one time. Verse Philippians 3.18 says, For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. That is describing, that is the picture of all who have rejected Jesus Christ, over and over again, rejected Jesus Christ, that is a picture. Their God is their stomach. All they can think about, and a lot of us, were there, and some of you may be there. You're just seeking God right now. That's where we are. But a lot of us, we all remember where we were, right? That is describing every one of us. All they can think about is their next meal. Their God is their stomach. They can just think about their next meal, their next, their next fix, their next drink, their next sexual act. That's all they can think about. Are you a spiritual zombie? Are you like that ant waiting to you know, die, really, spiritually? Die physically? Are you, are, are, are you a spiritual zombie? We all were there one day, but you can be free today. Ephesians, I've read this many times. I'm going to read it again. Ephesians 2, verse 1 says this. As for you, and this is all of us, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But, and this is our hope, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You can be free by putting your faith in God's grace. God's grace is he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross, his one and only son to die on a cross to pay for our sins. He took the payment. He was the lamb on the altar. Remember we talked about the lamb on the altar. He was a substitute. He took our place. And if we will accept God's grace, if we will put our faith in what Jesus has done for us, we can become brand new people, no longer under the power of the world, no longer under the power of the spirit of this world, who is Satan. We are now full of the Holy Spirit's power. Every one of us can have that. Have, are you free of that? Are you free today? Do you want to be? You can do it today. And not only that, this is a picture of all of us before our faith in Christ, but it's also a picture of us if we are backslidden. Remember that old, that old word, backslidden, sliding back. We put our faith in Christ, we're following, we are backslidden. In uh, 1 Corinthians, it talks about being carnal. 
Or the new version is worldly. We, are, we, we become like the world. Even though we are a new, person, a new creation in Christ, but we slide back, we, we fall back, we become carnal and worldly. And we end up, and this is the crazy thing, and I see it all the time, uh, I've been there, we all end up in the same miserable state that we used to be in. Just like before we were a Christian, we end up in that same miserable state, even more miserable. More miserable. There's no one more miserable than someone who is a Christian and isn't living like a Christian. Someone who is living in the flesh, living in the world, they are miserable. We've all been there, haven't we? we know, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe it's for a day, maybe it's for a week, maybe it's longer, but we know how bad, think of how rotten we feel after a day living out of fellowship, out of the Spirit. Think about years of that. That's how miserable someone is. And that's why I know these Christians that used to be so strong, and now they're drinking this and huffing this and shooting up this and doing anything to try to kill the pain because they're miserable. And why are we, if, if, why? Why are we miserable? If you're a Christian, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you, you can never enjoy the world again. You never did enjoy it. It was killing you. You were like an ant, you know, the zombie ant. It's going to kill you. But now you can't even enjoy it even a little bit. You can't. You can't. It's just, it's impossible to enjoy sin. You can try. Go on back. But you're never going to be happy. You're going to be miserable. Why? Because Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. If you grieve the Holy Spirit, you're going to be grieved. You're going to come to grief. You can never be happy again in sin. It's impossible. Are you living in the flesh or are you living by faith like Elijah? Which brings us to the second uh, part of it was Elijah and his faith. And I'm going to read the verses again. Look at the difference between Ahab and Elijah. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink for there's a sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. <laughs> oh, I added that part. Okay, but that's in the Hebrew. Okay, uh, I'm pretty good at it, aren't I? I can do all the farm noises. But anyway. Uh, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. What a difference. Elijah was living by faith, and it shows in two huge ways right here. Living by faith. First of all, it shows by what he could hear. It says he could hear the sound of rain. But... Ahab didn't hear it. Ahab couldn't hear it because he had ears of flesh. He couldn't hear it because there was no physical sound of rain. He was hearing something spiritually. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Wait till we get to the next part. It took a while for rain to appear. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Nowhere. But he could hear rain coming. How could he hear it? Through his heart. Through the spirit. That's what Ephesians 1.18 is talking about. We just were in Ephesians. In Ephesians 1.18, he says, listen to what it says here. It says, I pray, that, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Some of your versions say open. The eyes of your heart may be open. Well, there's a song like that, right? All right? And so that, that's what he's telling me. You can hear it in the heart. He, had, he also had faith in God's word, in his word. And remember back in 1 Kings 18.1, when God sent him on this little adventure? He says, after a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. God said he's going to send rain, not a cloud in the sky. Ahab's waiting for it. I'm mean, sorry, Ahab, yeah, Ahab's not waiting for rain. Elijah's waiting for it because he believed God's word. He believed the promise. So that even though it's very dry, there's not a cloud in the sky, he is planning for the rain. He's planning a, his life around it like it already happened. That's what it means to live by faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is being sure of what you hope for and being... Being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. That's faith. Being sure of what God has promised in his word. It, 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 that's what faith does. It, it helps us to live a whole different way. When I remember on the farm, every day my dad would go up to the barometer. Anybody know what a barometer is? 
It's on the wall. And he'd go up and he'd tap the barometer. What's he waiting to see? What's going to happen? Is there going to be rain? And if the barometer fell, he'd say, uh-oh, might be, might be getting some rain. It went up. Nope, no problem. But he tapped that barometer to see. And, and he, would, he daily did that. And then he would plan the rest of the day around that. Am I going to plow? Am I going to plant? Am I going to do hay? Or am I going to stay inside the barn today? You know, I'm going to do something else. He planned around that barometer, tapping that barometer. And that's what our faith does. We all have a spiritual barometer through the Holy Spirit. We have the spiritual barometer inside of us. That's what faith does for us as Christians. We, we can have the Holy Spirit. And, and we know he allows us to see how God is moving in the world. He allows us to see how God is moving in the church, in, in our community, in our country. He allows us to see how God is moving in our life, in our family, through our kids. He lets us see how God is moving, and that tells us how to live. We have his word, we've got the barometer, and we know how to live. Very, very important. That's what faith does for us. It's that spiritual barometer. Now, the second way that we see Elijah living by faith is he prayed. He not only acted on whether, you know, by the promises of God. He was in tune with what God was doing, but he also prayed. He prayed. And first he heard the sound of rain, and now he waits on God. Notice that? First he, he knows God's working, but then he prays. He waits on God. He waits on God. He, when, you, when we tap that barometer... And we, we see what God's word says and what, what the Holy Spirit is telling us God is doing. The next step is, okay, now I'm going to wait. In, de- in dependence. Very, very important step. Prayer is all about dependence. It's all about surrender. It's not, you don't pray to, we don't pray to say, God, this is what I want you to do. Here's my list. No, no, no. It's, God, what are you doing? What do you want me to do? What's your list? That's what prayer is. We get it all mixed up, you know? We try to tell God what to do, but prayer is really about getting alone and getting quiet with God and just, okay, God, what's, what's next on your list? What do you want to do? But too often, uh, instead of tapping the barometer and waiting, too often instead it's different. It's, um, it's, it's more like what happened to me on the way back from the Philippines. I was in the Philippines with Joshua and Megan, the kids, and we were, I was sitting in between them, and we were given this long flight. The last leg was like 17 hours. I'm like, oh, thank you, God, that we have this movie screen in front of us, and we can watch stuff and listen to stuff, and, and you're going to get us through these 18 hours. Well, so you got to tap. You just touch the screen, and things pop up, and you start doing it. Well, these guys are watching stuff and enjoying stuff. they got the earplugs, and they're enjoying themselves. Mine wasn't working. And so I'm like, you know, I'm like touching it and touching it and touching it and, and nothing's happening, right? And, and, I'm, and I'm like, you know, and so I'm starting to hit it harder and hit it harder and hit it harder. Like, Dad, stop it. You know, you don't need to do it that hard. I go, yes, I do it. Right. We, we had a little discussion. Some people would call it an argument. But anyway, I'm tapping, tapping, tapping. And the guy in front of me probably thought there's a woodpecker on the plane. You know, bam, 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 bam. I'm tapping, tapping. And because what I wanted to come up wasn't coming up, right? Something else would come up. Or, or nothing would come up. Or something would come up and then it wouldn't go fast enough. It just would freeze. And something was wrong with my screen. So I kept tapping it harder and harder and harder. And they said, Dad, it's not how hard you tap. You just got to touch it. It's like a touch phone, you know, which I'm very bad with too. But anyway, the, we don't go there. But they're like, just touch it. And I'm like, it doesn't work. And like, let me do that. Well, anyway, it was a loud flight. I'm surprised they didn't escort us off. But we were over the ocean. But anyway, the... Uh, they said they'll never travel with me again. I said, good, because you're not going to travel with me again. But anyway, the, uh, but we, that sounds funny, but don't we all do that spiritually? We tap the barometer. We touch the screen. Okay, God, what's up? And we don't like what the screen is showing. You ever have that happen? We don't like what God is showing us is going to be happening or what is happening. And so what do we do? <laughs> tap, 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 louder, harder, 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 right? I know we all do it. Or... Or we, something's on the screen that God shows us, but it doesn't happen as fast as we want it to happen. Where we don't like waiting for the next step or the next answer. We don't like waiting for what God is doing, not doing. So what do we do? Tap, 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 you know? We get crazy. 
Nobody here, but you probably sat next to somebody in the plane that's done something like that or in the car today. But anyway, uh, that, that's what we do, right? And we, we, we get impatient because God's going too slow. How are we living? Are we living by faith or in the flesh? What are we living by? The crises of life, the crises of life expose how we're living. Did you realize that? The hard things, the trials, the crises of life expose something. They show us, or our spouse or our family, they show us if we're living by faith or flesh. That's what gets exposed by the crises of life. Do, do, we, do we hit, when we're going through a crisis, do we hit the buffet line like Ahab did? Do we hit the bottle? Not just alcohol, but the opioids, you know, do we hit the bottles, you know? Do we, in order to cope, in order to get through it, do we hit the bottle in some way? Or do we wait, hit our knee and go into communion with God? Do we go to his word and the promises in his word? Do we spend that communion time? That's what we're still bringing communion today, but it's really all about reminding us that we need that constant communion. And living by faith, makes all the difference. It helps us see God's hand. When we're living by faith, it helps us see God's hand in everything. The blessings and the trials, everything that happens, we can see God's hand. What God is trying to ha- accomplish in my life, even the trials. The promise, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his good purpose. It doesn't matter what, whether it's good, bad, good, bad, and the ugly. We know God is going to somehow take it and bring about his good purpose in our life. We know he's going to work it for good in our life somehow. And when we can see that, it makes such a difference. Uh, I saw a great story last week, and it just hit me, and I saved it, and I'm glad I did because it hit me when I was doing this sermon. Giant pothole may have saved man's life. Did you hear that story? Giant pothole. This guy uh, every, it says here, everyone complains about potholes popping up in the spring, but one man may have potholes to thank for saving his life. He's in Nebraska, and he started having heart problems. So the rescue squad came and grabbed this 59-year-old man. His heart was racing at work. He had no history of heart problems, but they, they started driving. It's a 20-minute drive to the emergency room. So it's 20 minutes. His heart is beating. Uh, let's see. It was up to 200 beats per minute. Not good, not good. But they didn't, they were getting nervous. Are we going to make it? You know, it's a long drive. You know, and they had ways to go, and his heart is beating. And all of a sudden, they hit a big pothole. Ambulance hit a big pothole. Oh, don't you hate that? I hit one yesterday. I was so mad. I was so mad. I was like, oh, my goodness. Then I went, oh, wait, remember that sermon? Remember, the, remember what happened? God, what are you trying to do here? And so, they hit the pothole, and by hitting the pothole, they said that the jolt of the pothole converted the, his heart, racing heart to normal. And it's rare, but it happens. Sometimes they'll be hitting a speed bump or a something, and it, it jolted the heart back to normal. Very well could have saved his life. And his friend, the friends of the patient, they interviewed him later, said he's going to be released from the hospital, blah, blah, blah. He said he will surely be looking at potholes a little differently from now on. (laughs) We all should, shouldn't we? The potholes of life. God often uses them to reset our hearts spiritually. Spiritually. God often uses them to reset our hearts. The potholes of life. That's what I thought about yesterday when I hit that big pothole and I got so mad. I, uh, I was like, okay, God, what are you trying to talk to me about? What are you trying to tell me? And it changed the whole perspective. But that's what, that's the, that's what happens when we're, we're living by faith. Living by faith. Living by faith allows us to view everything differently. Everything. To experience joy no matter what we're going through. That's what it, it helps us to do. 
living by faith. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah, I've sent out the devotional so many times, uh, Turning Point, Dr. Jeremiah. This week he had one in that I, I saved, and I'm glad I did once again because it was like so powerful. He talked about the difference between joy and happiness. And he, used, he said that joy and rejoicing, same word basically, it is like in the scriptures over 400 times while the word happiness is only 20 times. Because there's a big difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is an emotion that results from our circumstances. But joy is a deep-seated conviction and, and a result of totally trusting God no matter what the circumstances is. We can only be happy if certain things are happening, but we can have joy no matter what is happening in our life. Because we trust God. We know there's a reason for the pothole. We know there's a reason for the blessing of the baby. We know there's a, there's a reason for everything. God has, has a reason for each of these things. And that's the difference. We can know joy no matter what. Um, a great example of having joy no matter what is my daughter Sarah. She'll be embarrassed about me telling this, but super athlete gets hit with this neurological problem and gets to the point where she couldn't even walk. And most of us would be really upset by that. But I tell everybody, you would never know Sarah had anything. Yeah, she has trouble walking, but she's at her games and she's cheering and you would think she just made the big shot in the game, the way she was acting at the game. Shuffling out to the team. With these new crutches she got. I was like, oh man. How are you doing? She goes, oh, it's great. No one can believe how fast I can go on these. Everybody at college is so impressed. She's got these leg braces. I said, Kim, how did she like them? What did she say? She goes, she's like, wow, I can color the coolest designs on these. Wear them around. It's crazy. It's joy. Now there's a treatment. They finally figure out what it is, and there's a treatment that we hope will work. We don't know, but we're hoping. But whether it works or not, doesn't matter. The girl has joy. That's what joy is. It's not happiness. It's way deeper. Are we living by faith? Are we trusting? Are we experiencing joy? Are we living by faith? Before we can live by faith, we have to experience God's power and, and, and his perspective. We must be saved by faith. We must be saved by faith. That's the first step. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We must put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first step. And that's what communion is all about. The, the, the bread represents the body of Jesus Christ that he gave on the cross. The, the cup represents the blood that Jesus gave that he shed on the cross for our sin. To wash away our sin. To take our place. That's what it's all about. It's a reminder of what Jesus did for us to set us free from spiritual zombiehood, to give us life now and forever. That's what it's a reminder of. It's also a reminder, communion, it's also a reminder as Christians to get away from the noise of the world. Just like Elijah went and got up there on the mountain and stuck his head between his knees praying. That It's a reminder to get away from the noise of the world and get alone with God. We need that daily time every day. 
constantly. This is just a reminder. This is just priming the pump. We're going to go to communion time now. And what we do is we just, uh, we just have some time of worship, uh, some, a song that will be sung, a worshipful song. And then whenever you're ready, you can just come forward and take the bread and take a cup and take communion. You can take it with your family, with someone, by yourself. There's no right or wrong way to take it. Uh, the, there's a couple reasons why you shouldn't take communion. Once again, it's okay if you don't. If you're just here and you're seeking, it's okay. Just sit and pray through this time. Wait for the next time. It's okay. We're not, nobody judges anybody. Nobody knows. It's between us and God. But if we are not a Christian yet, then we shouldn't take communion because it's, the Bible says very clearly it's for those who know Jesus Christ. But I hope you do it today. You can, put, you can put your faith in Christ today. The second is that there's something we're not willing to surrender. There's an area of flesh in our life, and we say, God, you can't have it. I won't give it up. Then we shouldn't take it either. But once again, this is the time to surrender it. You don't have to be perfect. You're just going to be perfectly willing to, to surrender something to Jesus today. That's all, it, that's all it, that takes. But I hope everyone does take it, and you can, but that's between you and God, okay? Um, let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, but today is the day the Holy Spirit is drawing you and calling you. You know you've been spiritually dead just like all of us were, but you can hear God calling, pulling you. To live free, to be set free through Jesus Christ. The simple prayer of faith. God, I walk away. I don't want to be spiritually dead anymore. I don't want to be under the world's power anymore. I don't want to be under sin's power anymore. I walk away. I turn away. I ask you to forgive me. I put my faith in your son Jesus who died for me. I give my life to him. If you have prayed that prayer of faith and something amazing has happened, you're in for the shock of your life. You've gone from being a spiritual zombie to being set free, to being alive, to being a brand new creation in Christ. You can now commune with God the Father anytime through his son Jesus. The Holy Spirit is actually living inside of you. When you open the Bible, it's going to come alive. It's going to be on fire. You're going to see things you never saw before. And you can commune with God any time. If you've taken that step of faith, then I want to encourage you to let somebody know. Maybe you're here with somebody, maybe a family member, maybe you tell me on the way out or send me an email or text. Let somebody know because we're going to encourage you and be excited for you. For those of us who have already put our faith in Christ, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Will we make that daily choice? Every day we have this choice, God. I want to live by faith, not by flesh. I want daily communion with you. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move in a powerful way through this communion time. Please complete what you've started through your word now. In Jesus' name.